Thank you. Thank you again for um, everybody rejoining us. So our um, closing keynote is a, a woman that Faith and I um, had the pleasure of meeting about a year ago, um, Roy Hartsfield. So um, we um, were fortunate enough last year to have the equivalent conference to this, where the theme was on artificial intelligence hosted by Google um, at their Mountain View campus. And um, one of the people who signed up, I don't know, a week or something, maybe two weeks before the deadline, was this person, and we didn't know who she was, but I see the company name come across, and it's Central Intelligence Agency. It's like, okay, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> Those of us who are nerds, it's like, this is going to be really interesting. So um, we're at the reception the evening before. Um, we're sitting down. We're having some appetizers. There may have been an adult beverage involved or two. Um, and she sits down next to us, and we're having this nice conversation. And it's like, where are you from again? I'm like, from the CIA. It's like, Oh, you're that one. Um, she didn't share any war stories with us, but she did share some stuff that I knew at that moment in time. I have got to have her come and speak. And one of the things that I think I shared with you was that I didn't know that the CIA was involved in helping to end human trafficking. Okay? If I'm a Gen Z, that's an issue that I'm pretty concerned about. And, you know, I think that that's an area that the organizations who are involved in real incredible social justice causes like that, they need to do a better job of communicating it. Not just for selfish reasons. There are good selfish reasons for doing that, but also to lead, to show by example that, you know, we can all do better. Ken, you talked a number of times uh, this morning, and it was fantastic about, you know, we don't have to wait for the schools to do this, for example. If you don't think that the students are being prepared, go on campus. Just about every single professor would be, I would love to have you as a guest speaker. Come into my classroom. It'd be fantastic. Um, so Roy was talking about human trafficking. She's not here to talk about that today, sadly. But um, maybe buy her a glass of wine or something later, and she will. But what she is here to talk about is an issue that we all struggle with. Um, it relates to diversity and inclusion. Um, specifically, but it also um, per, uh, relates to a lot of other issues in so-called cost centers, like HR. And that is getting buy-in from the C-suite. How do you get your manager, how do you get your hiring manager, how do you get the CFO to give you the money, to give you permission to do these great things? You may have great ideas, but if you just go and give them the warm fuzzies, it's going to be really hard for somebody uh, at the CEO, CFO, COO level to say yes to that. Um, I can't even imagine the bureaucracy that must exist in a big governmental organization, whether that's an intelligence agency or, you know, the IRS or whatever. The, the layers that they have to go through, the number of people along that path that can say no, you might get 10 yeses and one no and it kills it. Um, so in about... 20 minutes, Roy's going to teach us everything there is to know about that. So, Roy, welcome. Do I have to hold this the entire time? Uh, this is, if I'm a little nervous, uh, well, public speaking is a nervous thing, but it's also because we're not used to being filmed. And I learned last night this is my sweet side, right? Uh, yeah, okay. More, that could be my sweet side. Uh, <laughs> uh, hello again. My name is uh, Roy DeHartsfield. Everybody just calls me Roy. And yes, I'm really from the CIA. Uh, we're real people. This is not a disguise. This is actually my hair. Um, let's see. I have been a STEM officer for 29 years. I just retired. Uh, and. I have lived most of my life and, and most of my career has been overseas in very hard areas. And I am used to getting information from a from my client, from uh, whatever uh, division I'm helping, and I, I, see what, I see what they want, I design it, I deploy, I deploy, I modify, I deploy. And I thought, and my first mistake was I thought I could do that with DNI. Right? Uh, I, they, they dragged me back from the field unwillingly. And I was, um, I was head of uh, the director of support uh, doing all their um, IT. And they said, Roy, well, we'd really like you to concentrate on uh, diversity leadership studies. So I became the deputy chief of diversity leadership study under um, the director, John Brennan, which he plays a lot into this role. Um, sorry, I've got to put my glasses on here. 
So I tell you, trying to ask people to modify their behavior and to look inside, that's, that's, that's pretty, I know everybody's nodding at me. That's pretty hard to do. I couldn't, I, I couldn't even get my husband to do it. He was, he, he was my case, my case uh, file, right? So he is a Caucasian male engineer from um, Rochester, uh, New York. So, uh, you know, if I knew it was working, uh, my husband was pretty much, much on it. Well, if you think about it, the CIA, we are a premier intelligence organization. And how we succeed is if we actually reflect who's in this audience, who's in the United States. And when John Brennan took office um, as our director, he looked to his left and to his right, and he looked down into the emerging leaders that were coming up in rank, and he said, man, everybody looks like me. Well, not necessarily from New Jersey and, and Irish, but pretty much from his, his um, same background. And he said, there's no way that this is going to work over the next five years if we're really going to be looking at hard targets. Um, and we're going to need people with native language, understanding those nuances and into, di into different cultures. So he asked um, Vernon Cook, who was head of the uh, president of the Urban League, to get a bunch of uh, senior advisors and look at our statistics of what we're doing wrong in the agency. And here's the thing with Brennan. It, it's, it's been done many times before, and it ended up in a, you know, 86 in a file somewhere. You know, that happens at a lot of organizations. But Brennan put his money where his mouth was. And he, he asked Vernon, he said, uh, I want you to give it to me unvarnished. And that is exactly what Vernon did. And it was, it was pretty brutal the first time I read the study. And by the way, the study's online. It's called um, Diversity Leadership Study. You can look it up. Some of the slides are from there. Um, and that's pretty much what he did. Let me go here. So this was the findings. I won't read it to you. Again, pretty much everybody looked like everybody up on the C-suite, as well as those that they were grooming to come up. And that was, that was a big issue. So here is basically the findings of this study. And I, I won't read them to you, but for the sake of this is the you know, uh, college recruiter, I'm basically going to study, I mean, uh, look at the recruitment efforts. Because to me, all things lead through recruitment, don't they? You have to get the talent in. You have to keep the talent. You have to grow the talent. Basically, what the findings was is the lack of prioritization results an unequal development of officers and perpetuates the belief among many officers that people, that people development is, mar is not part of achieving mission. I can say that from the, from the ground up. If my manager that was from the old school, not being ages here, I am old school, right? But if, if, if that's the way that he behaved and, it, and he moved up the ranks, well then that's, that must be the way that I must behave. And that must be the way that I mentor my, uh, my, my people to behave. So we had to change that. So Director Brennan, the first thing he did is he made his seniors accountable for DNI. Within six months, every executive senior officer had a diversity inclusion as one of their performance objectives. And there is one thing about the CIA. If, for us, if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist, right? So I just can't go to a uh, Martin Luther King event, and then that's a checkbox, right? No, I have to blog about it. I need to be um, attending an agency resource group, an ARG that is not like me. I need to be really looking out at who is in my staff, what, what types of people, backgrounds do I actually need to complete my teams. But then he went steps further. He affected bonus with this. Yeah. Oh, all of a sudden, I got your attention, right? That's exactly what happened to the C-suite. Oh, that's going to affect the, my, my end of the year bonus, my exceptional performance awards? Yeah, it did. And believe me, he held, he held tight to that. And not only did he hold tight, but all of the C-suite every, and every director it did, as well as it also affected future assignments. Now, if you're looking at a projection of a career, you basically said, oh, I want this job, that job, right? Well, if you're blocked from having a job that you really want it, because you weren't given, given it all in diversity and inclusion, that, that, uh, that kind of messed you up over the next five to six years. So just that alone helped alter some of the C-suite's opinion. I'm not saying that they weren't on board. There were a lot of people on board. 
Um, as the director says, we need many different prisms to look through when we're looking at hard operational issues. Not only, not only do we need you at the table, but we need your full voice at the table, regardless if, if you're agreeing with us or not. And that's, that's a hard gig to do. All right. Okay, so I'm Hawaiian, so we talk story a lot, uh, right? So I have this love and hate with statistics. This is me on a bench. Looks like I'm doing a secret ops, right? I'm about to put that X on, and they're going to come and do a brush pass with me. No, I'm actually in Belgium waiting for the waffle stand to open across the street. <laughs> right? So you have to be very careful with stats. You have to make sure that even when you're asking for the, for the stats, that there's not bias just in the question that you're looking at. You have to make sure that the data you get, you're never going to have pure data, but that it's the best data that you could do on the day that you were running that data. Right? And what we do is, Verify, verify, verify. So we ended up not using one HR resource, but several. And on top of that, making sure that we were um, interviewing employees and um, retired employees. I think, I mean, they used hundreds of employees for this. So it just wasn't about the stats. It was also about the feelings of how people felt. Um, I think I have another story here. Hold on just a second. If I don't stay to the program, then, um, then I get in trouble. Um, whoops. So I am from the Director of Digital Innovation. So this is all your cyber, your data scientists, I think STEM rocks. And again, when I'm pitching a new program, a new platform, I can't go and pitch without telling a story. No data without a story, no story without data. This helps a lot because what it does is it helps whoever it is that you're asking, the C-suite, whoever, it's, it's getting to the bottom line. And it helps drive in, I guess on a human point, what you're actually asking for. The other thing is um, you have to get off the X. Do you guys understand what that means? That's an operational term. It means when everything's hot and heavy and, I'm, you know, and there's stuff coming at me, I have to jump over left or right and I have to get off the X. This is where I think our C-suite actually did well. What we did is we, and, and we found out people really have good intentions. Don't they have good intentions? And sometimes they're not the right way to give back in diversity and inclusion. So we, we actually came up with a list. We love list on how to give back to diversity and inclusion. And I have to say, the C-suite went off. They did. Um, they came out on the, on the lines with us at a recruiting events. There's nothing like hearing Sean Roach talk about his challenges um, growing up at a university that the students just eat it up, right? And not only that, but we were pairing them with new employees, right? So here you have the senior telling you know, the whole career story, and then you have our new officer saying, well, th this was my journey going through the security process. We, don't, we, we try not to hide from that. We try to you know, bring back the veil, and this has been my experience. Um, John Brennan was up in New York, and he was the keynote speaker at Pride and Prejudice, an LGBTQ event. I mean, I just have so many stories about how once they were told um, who was that that we were talking about? Once, once, once they were authorized, basically, or permitted to do these things, and you gave them the list, they loved it. And in so many ways, um, for instance, mentoring somebody that doesn't look like you. I mean, that doesn't seem so hard to do, right? Uh, <laughs> but that was an eye-opener, just not for the C-suite. I, I actually find that, to me, the hardest gig was that uh, team lead and that, that uh, second management layer. That, to me, that was the, the nut that was really hard to break. And then um, making the C-suite accountable. And this is my story. I hope I don't get in trouble for this. All right. Um, well, I'd like, I'd like to tell the good and the bad and the ugly. I had this officer. Well, he was a senior officer. He was my boss's boss's boss. And I had just come back from that office. And this office is a lot of engineers. And they're mostly um, Caucasian male of... Uh, you know, all, all with STEM backgrounds. And I'm doing my DNI gig, and I'm up there, and I'm showing them their stats, and, and I'm pleading with them, you know, let, let, let's at least look at this. And, um, and I'm kind of doing a soft pitch. I wasn't even doing a hard pitch. And no joke, the guy at the table that's in charge, 
um, we'll call him Steve. Uh, <laughs> Steve, Steve goes, Roy, you know what the problem is? When there's a hard job, people like you don't apply. And he said this in front of the entire senior staff. And I said, P people like me? Are you talking about minority female? And he goes, yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. And I'm like, brother, it's on, right? <laughs> it's on. I have the full authority of the director. I'm speaking truth to power. And I said, well, Steve, when people like you, mentor, and you're a network engineer from Ohio State, Caucasian male, and everybody in your back pocket that you reach out to is what? A network engineer, white, basically from, you know, Ohio State, then, then what, what, what chance do I have? And not only that, but if this person makes a mistake during the job, oh, we're, we're grooming them, he's growing, but let me make that mistake, and it was, oh my goodness, you know, that, that, that was too much of a stretch. Maybe, maybe we shouldn't give her an assignment. And then I really laid it on, because I said, not only that, but I know if, you, if you're hunting me in the hallway to even offer me that job, that's pretty much a very, you know, a crap job. And nobody really wants it, right? So where are you going to be when I, I am not as successful as I can be? And you could have heard a pin drop. And I'm thinking, oh, Lord, here we go. I'm going to, and um, he pulled me aside later. <laughs> and first he apologized. And he said, how can I change? I don't understand what I'm doing wrong. Right now, this is the guy that's in charge of all the deployment out into your war theater, right? So this is a very important guy. And I told him, I said, you know, don't look at our color and our female, you know, our femaleness. Look at our performance appraisals. Look at them without judgment, right? And there are a lot of good women that are working for you now that just need that chance to go out. And within four months, guess what? He did just that. And not only that, but he supported them in their assignment. And all of those women that he took out on that time have succeeded, progressed, and been, been promoted. So I'm, I'm very proud. I mean, but my knees were shaking. <laughs> all right. Uh, OK. Again, here's my stats. This is dated from 2014, because th this is when I was the chief. But it, you can see the agency population is right here. So what it's basically saying is that throughout their career, most minorities and females were not rising past GS-13, which is what we would consider uh, right below emerging leader. And that's, that's pretty good. Uh, here's a bonus question. For the agency, what, what um, nationality or background do you think it's hard to hire for? Nope. Hispanic female in a STEM. And why is that? Culturally, do they really want, I mean, do they trust the agency? Yeah, culturally, isolation, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, so, so what, do we, what do we do about that? Um, if you, over here, uh, the by grade, the common attributes to senior rank, this is probably one of the smartest things we did, I think, is we took all of our executives and we said, what were those attributes? How, how did you get to be here? And these were the four attributes that they, uh, that they all came, it was the single thread. Technical expertise, you gotta be good at what you do. And I'm the worst, don't, don't come to me and ask me to sponsor you or mentor you and, and you're not giving, giving me it all, right? Um, networking, or as I say, guanxi, right? Now I'm gonna use my husband as my example. He's from New York. He knew how to network from birth. He'll meet you and automatically start thinking, how can I, you know, how can I use this person? Not in a bad way, but, you know, how can I connect them? Whereas I was not doing that. And that, that is a huge difference between the 13 and the 14. Uh, calculated risk taking. I know as women, we're, we're a little gun shy on calculated risk taking. In fact, I was just talking, I won't call her out, but I was talking to a woman here today. We were talking about a position, and the first thing she did was started going down the vacancy notice of what the requirements were, right? And worried that the company won't like her. And I said, oh, sister, you got it wrong. It's what you're bringing to them. You know, if I like a job, I don't even really look at the bullets. I just apply, and then I tell them why it's awesome to have me there. 
right? So, you know, that's a whole different mindset. And then mentoring, mentoring and sponsorship, that is key. That is key, especially when you're at that um, panel, you have to have some advocates in your corner, right? And that is, is exactly, and I had to explain this to my mentees, that is exactly why they were getting upset because certain people were getting asked on tiger teams and for certain assignments. A lot of that happens in the back room when they're first looking at assignments going, hmm, I think Roy could do that job, right? You want to be one of those people. Um, now, wouldn't that be nice to know those common attributes when you entered on duty? Wouldn't that be nice to know so you could already start working for it? With the mentoring that was happening across the C-suite, and by the way, um, is that politically correct to say millennials? The new generation was upward mentoring the, direct, uh, the director uh, and the deputy director of the CIA. And let me tell you, they were not nice. They were giving it to them like, hey, this, 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 uh, this is not good with me. And it turns out, and it was funny because they talked about it at, the, uh, at, the, at Brennan's table. And they didn't realize that all the mistakes that they were making. And they have better relationships with their kids now. Well, A, they're cooler, right? But, um, but they could understand um, the prism of, of which they were coming from. Sorry. Okay, by education, I was like going back and forth on this. As an Asian Pacific Islander, we actually have the highest uh, um, numbers of doctorates and master's degrees in the agency, and yet as an Asian Pacific Islander, we weren't rising past 13 normally. And I almost got ran out of my own agency resource group because I was their senior advisor, and I was like, listen, um, I mean, in my old school, Right, I come in, I look down, I do my job, and I'm supposed to be rewarded. But that is not how life is here. You have to look up, you have to take some risk with your, um, with your journey as an agency officer. You have to raise your hand and do what we call goat belly projects, which means those things that must get done but you're probably not gonna get credit for, right? So you have to take some risk. And we were very risk averse, at least in that ARG. And so what I did is I brought in people that were not like Asian Pacific Islanders to help mentor them. And they, uh, the 20 officers that I was mentoring, they've all risen, risen and grown. A lot of them are out in the field now. So I'm very proud of them. But that was an eye opener for, for my own people. And I have to say, I was part of the problem because I was stagnant at GS13, I'm out in the field and I'm hitting my head, and I'm like, why is so-and-so being promoted over me? Why am I not? And it, it took a mentor to tell me. Um, my mentor, Jack, would come in at 5 a.m. DC time to mentor me out in the foreign field. And he, was, he made me sign a non-disclosure because he told me everything. And he said, you need to go out and do these types of projects. And what what well, my thing is, I love the pointy end of the spear. I love the sexy, right? I like the new tech. And he said, you've got to do some of that back end stuff. So I did, and it actually helped. All right. Uh, male, female. You guys are a little surprised by this one? <laughs> As you can see, um, Caucasian females have risen a lot over the years. In fact, uh, if, if I was probably going to run this again, it'd probably be higher. Um, not so much for minority women and minority men. Why do you think that is? Nobody? You got something on your, I can tell you got something to say. They don't want to be involved with the man. <laughs> they don't want to be, well, sometimes it's a hard gig. <laughs> a lot of our Caucasian females were being mentored by Caucasian males at this point. And I have to say, and I applaud my sisters, because they, they organize very, very well. And I have to say, our female ARG group is, I mean, it's very strong. And the great thing is, the Caucasian female has turned around and helped everybody else. Not only minorities and males, but a lot of the, what we consider mid-hires, people just coming um, into the agency um, over the age of 30. Well, I guess that's a, yeah. That's a, uh, and then, um, so if I were to run these numbers again, it'd actually be much stronger. But I wanted to keep that in there. Um, go ahead. So 
I'm not surprised by that, right? The reality is white females have been great beneficiaries of all the DNI. Yes. That's just a fact. Yes. It's a fact. That's great, but this is how it is. Well, here's my story. I and I don't know what to do about that except for I know that my Amazon warriors are helping other Amazon warriors now, at least in the agency. I, I, can, I can attest to that. So I had, it's one of the most senior ranking um, engineers probably in the, in the agency. I mean, just forward leaning guy. And he called me one day and he said, Roy, do you think I'm inclusive? And I was like, what shall I call him? I said, Hank, uh, I'm going to give you five seconds to take that back. Because you know this is me you're calling. He goes, no, I really want to know. And I said, no, you're not. And like my other guy, Steve, I said, you're from um, Clemson. You're a short white male. And your deputy is from Clemson, short white male. We've all traveled together, right? And um, he's like, well, I don't understand. Why is that a bad thing? I said, well, with my time with you, because we served overseas together, here I am, a minority female apps developer, right? And yet I have a different prism from you. And there was a lot of times operationally where you guys came to that conclusion too quick. And I brought that which is the other, the devil's advocate into the, you know, so, so through me and, and actually both my husband too, who didn't have a networking background, he was a, a platform guy. I mean, we did a lot of great things together because we were a team. And he goes, well, I didn't see it that way. So what he did, and I, I, I know he had an affinity for um, strong women with opinions. He did. I mean, he just wants to do the work, right? He doesn't. And, but that, that's not what inclusion is about, is it? Inclusion is about bringing everybody's voice, and there has to be some tension in the room. Um, but i got to say, he got up, and he... He, he looked to his left and the right, and he said, I have missed this person that I've been overseas with. I've missed this person that came up with this great platform. He goes, why don't I take a chance? To me, it really wasn't a chance. It was the smartest thing he could have done, and, and put them on my team, and he did. And those people also rose in rank. And not only that, but then once those, once those other officers saw do that, right, other officers that were like, I know, I just totally gave up the name, right? Um, they started doing the same thing because they saw him winning. They saw him getting more funding. Things got turned over quicker, right? He was taking a chance. And that's all he needed was that gentle push. And i got to say I'm very proud, very proud of the officer that he is. I mean, he's always been a great officer. All right. There's a, um, a study that the Clayton Institute did last year, I think it was, or the year before, and I can send you guys a copy of it around the – they did a study on – underrepresented men and women mm -hmm. in promotional velocity, mobility velocity, because they felt like it wasn't great and, and the outcome wasn't, was exactly what they thought. But it was, there were some interesting intersections around certain types of companies and, and how, and it goes back to what you said was how white women were rising faster because they had white male sponsors and stuff. And so I just found that super quote that you said that very interesting, like that's what's out there too in some of the areas, but the Clinton Institute comes out as a gender research institute and it comes out of Stanford University and a lot of their studies you can find online, um, but if you can't find it, just ping me because um, I thought it was super close to what you're talking about. I, I ain't hating on anybody, I'm just saying, that's the, that's the stats. Do you have something to say? Okay, I, th I think this got stuck, so I hope I didn't pass anything. So, measured progress within 15 months. So, my next assignment was basically the chief of um, DDI hiring. So, this is all your recruitment. And when I took over, it was something like 26%. And the diversity numbers were not that good. By looking at our hiring, and I'm talking about, and th this is the beauty, and I'm I would, I'd applaud you if you really got a lot of C-suite behind you. But this is, this is why Brennan made a difference. And, and as well as Gina and Pompeo, all, you know, it didn't matter who was in charge. They, they knew the bottom line was about getting, getting, getting people in. As we rose up 
over 250% in our hiring. And what it came from was looking at our, our hiring standards, taking the bias out of questions, trying to take the bias, I mean, we're, we're not there yet, right? Taking the bias of um, when you're actually face-to-face -face doing the recruiting. And then, um, it's, I'm really proud of these numbers because if you think about it, I'm competing with your Google, your Amazon, and I love those companies, so don't get me wrong, because they helped me out a lot. Um, but that's pretty good for a government agency. And to think that we rose and stayed at 40% with our minority numbers across hard STEM, that's, that's a pretty good deal. And I'm especially a proud, uh, a proud of our TSO cadre. Our TSO cadre are, are officers, they're in charge of satellites all the way down to the LAM, right? Most of them are ex or retired military Caucasian male, right? And yet they were part of the solution. They got their butts out because they once once they saw that hey we actually need this you know that which is the other they were out recruiting at all events they were correcting other officers about when when their biases were popping up and they had the highest um, number of diversity hires it was our TSO cadre so I make I'm very um, happy and the back end of that is we got more students in. Not only did we get more students in, but then they saw that their voices mattered, right? And then they stayed. So I think we're like 85, 90% of re, uh, re retention of turning an intern over into staff. Mm. I know, right? That's, that's pretty good. I always say go somewhere else because you're never going to get a better data set than what I have. So, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. You'll, you'll, you'll come back. I'll, 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 I'll play the long game with you. Um, and really looking at the LGBTQ plus uh, events, um, HBCUs, we have signature schools that we really invest more time in. If you want to know what it's like to interview for the agency or what's it like to do a STEM briefing to a layman audience, guess what? We will help you with that, right, for our, for our signature schools. Um, I, I, I got this a lot. We went to Lesbian to Tech, an event that I really loved, and they're like, why are you here? Right? So, you know, th there's the whole myth of the agency, of, of what we were in the past, and it's, it's kind of nice to break that. And um, I, I tell you what, best GPAs, LGBTQ community, great, great at uh, empathy, great at adversity, and, you know, uh, just, just great officers. And then um, with our hiring advisors and our recruiters, you had to own what you did out in the field. Right. So if I'm out um, mentoring and coaching, if I'm out recruiting, you had to own whatever it is that you were there, and you were you were being held responsible for that. So all of them got unconscious bias. Um, the DDI was the first directorate to put empathetic questions and diversity questions in, um, and oddly enough, we had to go through legal to get that done. Right. So I'm like, okay, I, I'm, I'm willing to do it. And then uh, in the end, I think our people stayed because, uh, because they were ohana. And that's a Hawaiian term for somebody that isn't necessarily family or family, but, but they have your best interest at heart. So I think that's why our, our retention has been remarkable. I don't know if this is actually working here. OK, my last story. OK, where we are today, we have a lot of legacy. And we have better hiring practices, but they are not like perfect. We, we still are evolving um, every day. And there is wider mentoring and coaching, just not classic, you know, who's in my office or whatever, but across the directorate. I have mentored people from across the IC, and, and you really learn about different other, agen uh, other agencies. And also, like I was saying before, headquarters and field. The beauty part is if people don't even think about DNI, right? If it just becomes a part of their day-to-day -day life, we're not there yet. That that's what we're trying to do in a talent acquisition. So we're trying all different things. I was telling somebody that we were actually considering talk about things that didn't work. We actually have you ever gone to a um, a racing event like a Talladega 500 or something like that, right? And you see the pit crew. Do you know there's algorithms on how to pick a good pit crew? Can you lift 500 pounds? What's your speed like on a rivet? And we actually 
you know, thought, could you do that with a team? You know, just take the names away. Could you actually just look at pr performance and actually build a pit crew? Um, but that didn't work out. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, we were turning every stone over, right? Um, and understanding unconscious bias, every executive had to take unconscious bias. And there is something different between sitting in a classroom and actually implementing. And this is where my last story is. There was, he was the chief of counterterrorism center. So we're talking about the guy that goes after the big, hard uh, targets uh, downrange. And he's a very tall uh, white male. And, he, and, and I'm giving him his numbers. Uh, obviously, I hated giving everybody their numbers, because that's when all the uh, hard conversations came in. And he said, you know, I, I took that unconscious bias class. And he goes, I was really surprised. And I'm like, oh, yeah? And he goes, yeah, I took the class, and then a week later, something was going on downrange, and I had to come in, and I had to get this email out. And it was really urgent, and I couldn't remember the group name, so I hand-packed everybody's name in. And I'm like, okay. And he goes, who do you think I forgot? And I'm like, I am not answering this question. And he goes, I, f I forgot this woman. And he goes, do you think she noticed? Do you, do you think she noticed? <laughs> yeah. I was like, yeah, dude, I think she noticed. And he goes, not only that, but she was African American. And I was like, okay. Hey, man, I'm not judging. I mean, I got, I got biases too. And I'm like, okay. So I looked at him. I was like, dude, what are you going to do about it? And he goes, first, I want to apologize to her. And I'm thinking, oh, man, was she, was she in Egypt or Syria? He goes, no, man, she sits right there, right there. And I'm like, oh, man, this. He goes, at first, I want to apologize to her about leaving her off the node. And, right? and then he went one step further. And this is why I worship this man. He held an all hands, because you know he normally does a recorder. And he specifically talked about unconscious bias. He made everybody everybody in the counterterrorist uh, center take un the unconscious bias class and they talked about what does that mean when they operationally go after an asset when they're looking at internal and external recruiting i mean he held them he held them to point and i'm just like man i know you jacked up over here but you sure made up for it over here right and he he is one of the most senior members of uh, the directorate of operations and when he retired, I had the honor of coming, coming to his retirement. And the very last thing he talked about was how, he, how much he really enjoyed giving back to diversity and inclusion. So he has, he has, to me, he's been a role model. And I have to say from the ground up, uh, speaking truth to power is probably one of the best things we, we gave to our legacy. Let's bring your panel up while if okay. there's a question, that's fine. But let's also bring the panel up. We were we really while well, they're coming up. We really were trying to look at every avenue, um, doing benchmarking with other companies about what worked and what didn't work. Um, I have to say, Brennan, ha having Brennan uh, back you was really good. Okay, we ready? Would you all like to take a couple couple minutes to introduce yourselves and your background? Oh, you guys go. My name's Sherry Crispin. Um, I am a student learner, a lifelong learner. Uh, probably the only thing that's worthwhile knowing about me right now is that uh, my first job, <laughs> I know, you're laughing over there. Uh, my first job was two blocks from here at Stevens Institute of Technology, where um, in order to put myself through graduate school, I was, uh, my first job was in career services. It was kind of an interesting time, learned a lot set me on an interesting path that's been around. And uh, this year, I celebrated two blocks from here, my 50th year from graduation. That's cool. So if you harbor any um, unconscious bias about old white guys, I got to tell you, I get over it for the moment. <laughs> Hi, my name's Marjorie McKamey. Uh, I have, I'm, I'm on the spectrum, and I have dyslexia, so apologies if I refer to my notes at times. Um, I am a senior recruiter with Franklin Templeton Investments. Uh, have been doing, actually, contract recruiting for a lot of years. Um, I also work with a company called Interns, I-N-T-R-N-Z. Uh, it's a startup, and we partner with Pace 
new school and school for visual arts to provide summer housing and internship experiences in New York City. Uh, I, uh, my first HR, I started in uh, fashion and had a, uh, an unexpected uh, tour or turn where I went to work in the career services office for what was then the oldest women's secretarial school in New York. Um, it was on a bet. I went, fell in love with the job, and uh, have been in human resources for 30 plus years. So worked with students, worked with interns, co-ops, um, love working with this particular, uh, this particular age, age range. So I will pass it on. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Ankit Somani. Um, because it's a diversity and inclusion panel, I'm an immigrant. I came to this country about 12 years ago and just amazing opportunities that the, com that the country gave. So I'm very blessed to be here. Uh, I'm also the co-founder of Alio. How many of you have heard of Alio, by the way, prior to this event? Okay, got it. I know Stephen did a fantastic job sharing a few times what Alio does. But uh, just to give you a, a short bit about it, Alio really helps HR broadly in recruiting specifically communicate better. And by better, I mean more delightful and efficient. And the way we do that is at the base offer a communication channel that works better in this day and age, which is texting and other form of uh, having a conversation. And on top of it, bots to automate parts of those conversation. So think about screening, scheduling, helping somebody find a job, uh, responding to a survey, asking questions, all of it. And we believe the combination of it really makes, uh, breaks down the walls around HR when it comes to people and makes it more personable uh, for somebody who wants to chat with HR. So that's a little bit about me. One sec. I just want to make sure everybody knows we will stop at 2.30 because I know people have trains and planes to catch. So get your questions in as things go on. Sorry. Sorry if it was me that went over. Um, and the, ver the first question is to you. Um, what does low bias recruiting look like? So I, I look at uh, low bias recruiting. Again, my learning is uh, both for the company that I have as well as the customers that we work with. And I've seen at least two key elements of it. The first is on the candidate side. So on the candidate side, I think of it as equal opportunity for everybody at every step, which means that whoever I am, wherever I am, I should be able to apply and in a fair way get assessed for the job, a fair way to get interviewed for the job, have the right opportunity to move forward. Even if I'm a talent or an employee working in a company, uh, I should have a fair way to express my opinion. So there is something from a candidate perspective. But now when you look at the recruiting teams, um, there it's about really understanding, you know, we've, we've heard a lot about unconscious biases, but it's about really understanding uh, what is a fair way to judge someone? How quickly you're making a perception in your mind versus not? And where is it that you can make a nuanced decision versus in other places where you may actually lead people on the wrong route? So it's the right combination of technology where it works best, gives opportunity to everybody, and then humans as they come in and really layer on top of uh, any given conversation the moral angle associated with it. So, so what type of training and accountability would that take? Yeah, and, and I'd love to uh, invite others to join in as well. But I've seen um, two aspects of training. One is uh, on the recruiting front, what questions can you ask? What questions should you really ask? How should you interact with somebody? How objective should you be? There's a piece about being objective which is very empowering because uh, if you are taking in all the data, then at the end of the day, you're really evaluating based on data. But sometimes if you know somebody's uh, cultural background, maybe you're able to be a little bit more lenient with them on one angle versus the other. So for example, in some cultures, it's you want the permission to have a conversation, or you want the permission to take a step. Whereas in others, 
it's okay to ask for forgiveness. And people operate differently in different cultures. So I think that is the layer where training really needs to be brought in, in my mind. Any other thoughts? Well, the only thing that, that occurs to me is you also have to understand the willingness of your culture, of your company's culture, to be able to expand to handle some of those issues. Because obviously the, the learning and the training can take time. They yeah. take cost. And we should be investing in that. And we should try to maximize the kind of our ability to adjust our culture to be able to, to accommodate folks who are coming in. And, and knowing that, that that continues to be different, that it continues to evolve. Well, since you were talking about money, could you give me an example of gaining allies to convince the C-suite to not only give me money, but their time? Um, the, only, the only piece to this is, and I always think in terms of tactics versus strategy. So if I'm sitting in, in a seat, uh, my tactic is I want to know who are the most un influential folks pretty much underneath the C-suite, the ones that the C-suite are looking at for that next move. And I want to make them extraordinarily successful. And so I try to influence by making, uh, by helping be successful the people who I think are extraordinary performers within the organization and the most open to being able to do it in ways that add value really for our culture long term. There's always a few. There's always the idiots that I, I hope uh, leave at some point. And they're the, they're the ones that I'm going to send those great jobs to that, uh, that come in for other companies, especially with competitors. But uh, that's a whole different set of tactics. So, so one is the tactical side. And the other, um, very honestly, is, is the strategy. And that is, I'm... I'm I view myself as world class, and I would want anybody who is in our space to view themselves that way. And that means understanding operationally what it takes to do that. And if you really believe that, that we should be changing things and getting the money, then you need to learn how to do uh, the right kinds of projects that um, analyze the data within the organization, develop proposals, and find people you can submit those proposals to, and do it over and over again until either you start winning, or you find that somebody else in another company is going to take you so that you can be in a leadership position and make things happen. You can wait for the leaders to tell you, or become aware of what goes on, or you can try to sell the leaders, even the toughest ones, but sell them based on what they know, which is what it, does it cost and what is the return in the short and long term. And if you need help doing that, then go talk to the CFO and say, hey, you know, I'm new in my job. I'm trying to better understand how to, how to win here. And I want you to help me um, develop the kind of templates that work in this organization because this is what I want to propose. And I've seen that over and over again in small doses in almost every, every company, and I bet most of you have, where somebody has just become a star, a shooting star, because they're willing to get outside of their job box and say, you know, this company needs something a little bit different, and they went and got help to get it done. That's how I do it. So, Roy, you talked about um, your Amazon warriors, and I have to say at Franklin Templeton, you know, we're a global company with over 9,000 employees. And we have a woman I'd call an Amazon warrior, Jenny Johnson, who has, um, is part of the family that founded this public company, but she will be, um, she will be uh, raising, um, she is moving into the CEO position as of, February, and so we've been listed as uh, last three years running as a, uh, a great company, one of the best companies to work for for LGBTQ. Um, the DNI uh, was um, folded into our corporate goals, uh, I think, three years ago. So it's on everyone's performance evaluation. Everyone has that throughout the company as part of their performance evaluation and part of their bonus opportunity. So, hit them where it hurts, right? Yeah, so how, 
how are they being measured though? Um, so, so in their performance appraisals, I mean, what are like the top three things that they're that they're like? Wow, okay, they're definitely giving back and in, um, into the LGBT. Well, so we've got we've got business resource groups uh, throughout the company. Um, we are. Uh, People are involved in those. We also have a program called Involved. Um, one day a year uh, is a paid day off to work in your community. You can work with your with your team. You can work with your department. Um, we have events going on all year long, and as part of your performance evaluation, you have to write. You know, you have to write in there what you have done to contribute to that. Um, so it's it, it, high accountability. Good, good. Okay, and Kat, do we have time for one more question? Yeah. Okay. Definitely. How does leadership take the pulse of the people in diversity and inclusion? There's a perception and then there's a reality. So. Yeah, um, I think it's very interesting. Uh, there was a lot of stats shown here throughout the day. But to me, even though I'm a numbers guy, numbers don't have that same level of impact. So I'll give you a very real example. We ran a pulse survey, I think it was about two weeks ago. It was shared maybe 5 a.m. in the morning by the HR leader. And I remember between 5 a.m. and 7 a.m., all I was doing was not looking at the numbers, but looking at the qualitative feedback that people gave. So there was a simple question that was asked, in three words, describe the culture, right? And there's so much that you can even get out of something like that. So one of the very undervalued things, just because everybody's calibration is at a different level, a very undervalued thing is to get qualitative feedback from people. And then it's very easy for any leader in the company to relate with somebody. Like if, if, if I know you super well and I hear a feedback from you which is qualitative, it's in a sentence that I can read and understand, the reaction I'll have to that is very different. I'm like, Wow, she feels that way, I need to change something. So um, in terms of measurement, I haven't found yet from the customers that we work with, numbers really creating that amazing level of impact. I've seen the qualitative side really do that well. At least that's a perspective. There's a shift for me though that's different. And that is it's combining not just our technology to be able to do a quick pulse survey, which we weren't able to do as easily years ago. But today we could do that. And so you do something in the morning, you get something in the afternoon. The question is then what do we do with that, you know, to, to really understand insights? And that's where leadership literally has to have a set of practices where they do things a little bit differently. It, it, it means that the head of um, one of the organizations, at least at the sea level or, or above, goes to lunch and sits down with people in the cafeteria, not in the uh, corporate... Um, the corporate lunchroom, um, and be able to, to actually say, hey, we did a survey this morning. I, I want to know a little bit more about what you're thinking about this. This is the results that came back. But tell me a story about this. Help me better understand what we should be doing about that. What are the insights that come from that? And then, then the leadership is demonstrating that they're at least putting their first step forward. Now if they take that and actually perform something or execute on something in relation to that, now it's cyclical and now we're in a positive cycle. It's when those surveys get done and nothing happens that they become meaningless. And then the technology gets blamed, it's the survey. Well, it's not the survey. It's how, it's how we react to information to not only build insights, but also make commitments to doing something forward. Oh, okay, so just quickly, uh, Franklin Templeton, you know, does the ubiquitous employee sentiment survey on an annual basis, but we've implemented a brand new tool. Uh, it's a crowdsourcing tool, and we want employees to submit thoughts, ideas, suggestions, um, you know, frustrations, and um, those are being monitored. Uh, that's being monitored on a regular basis, and. Um, Management has allocated funds for up to a dozen projects a year to come out of the the thoughts, the ideas, um, the you know the complaints, the feedback. So management is committed to financially 
um, acting on those results. And it's just a novel way to, to be uh, allowing employees to submit feedback and, and thoughts and ideas. Thank you. I, I, I just want to briefly respond to what Jerry as well. Jerry said as well, one, we've changed surveys to more mini conversations. So instead of once in three months, once in six months, really long survey that you're procrastinating until your manager is really forcing you to do it, convert it to more mini conversations. Think like three or five questions delivered in a conversational manner that you can respond to. So that's point one. Second to Jerry's point, uh, the moment we read that, that here are five top performers who are even facing this kind of issue, the functional leaders were directed to go on walks with those people through the rest of the day. So it wasn't like, oh, next one-on-one, -on -one. no, no, stop, go for a walk. And the third thing is, as you come up with an action plan, tell your employees, here is the action plan, and then continue to follow up on, hey, is it actually making a difference or not? Because not closing the loop, which was part of the point what, what Jerry was saying, is one of the reasons uh, that we've seen people disengage and say, hey, does it even matter? Should I even respond to something like that? Thank you. So you talked about feedback. And um, Facebook has been doing a lot on their platform to, talk, to promote their diversity platform. But just in the past two weeks, their African American employees have published very candid um, stories about how they're being treated in parallel to what they're saying about diversity. And so when you think about Mark, um, Zuckerberg, I don't need to say his last name, um, Mark, um, Cheryl, and Maxine, who was their diversity officer, in addition to formal surveys, when you have a set of employees who are not hiding behind anonymity saying, great that this commercial is out there, but here's our real experience, does that hold or should it hold their C-suite to a higher level of accountability to say, this might be what we're saying we want everybody to experience, but we have a group of employees who are being very vocal about being excluded from what they say they're trying to create. What accountability should they have within their organization, but then publicly and globally when you have people who are being, being very vocal about the experiences that they're having? I think they should have full accountability. Yeah. So, so the reality is that some companies are a lot more visible. In this room, there's a load of companies with very, very high visibility, and so there's a lot of attention anytime anything actually happens. Uh, the speed with which something uh, that, that would relate to Google or, or Microsoft or Facebook as just three examples uh, is even faster, right? Um, but by, by the same token, the standards ought to be there for them to be able to address that almost instantaneously in an open, transparent way. And we have yet to learn full transparency, what full transparency means. Yeah, I, think, I think we are still years away from being able to be comfortable in sharing income, right, and compensation. Only 27% of the companies in the United States have actually done the calculation on gender parity. That sucks. <laughs> That's a lot of people here in this room whose, whose companies do not know on purpose whether or not they are paying women less than men. On purpose. And why? Because if, if in fact you do the calculation, it's discoverable. Well, yeah, it is discoverable, so do something about it. Fix it. Why would somebody say, so the calculations right now from Harvard, from uh, World Economic Forum, from others, range from 70 years to 200 years before gender parity exists. I don't know about you, but I'm going to be sad when all of you are gone and, and they finally get to that, you know, because you won't have seen it. I mean, this is, this is dumb. So more and more what I hear people saying, whether it be closed doors or whatever, is I'm tired of waiting. And fundamentally, if you're not saying that out loud in your company and your company's not doing the calculation, then you are part of the problem too. In my opinion, we have a responsibility to step up and take risks. And you've heard that all day long. Truth to power, a whole bunch of other kinds of stuff. Part of our role should be to lead from wherever position we are in. And that, 
That brings risk with it. I understand that. And if you don't do it because you have to put food on the table, you have kids, you have a whole bunch of other things, I get it. Just look in the mirror and know at some point I do, I will step up. But we, we need to look at those issues, right? It's not just Facebook. Facebook's got to solve their problems. They've got to say, if we've got people in this company that are not being treated well, we need to have uh, a team that fundamentally is capable of listening, listening well, demonstrating that they've listened, and then executing on a plan in a reasonable period of time, not 70 years. And so, and the same thing with gender parity. Every single company in this room should have done the calculation, should have informed their employees what it is, should have dem demonstrated the, the efforts that they're making to make those changes, and when they're going to audit it next. Uh, I'm finishing my rant, so I'm a little bit left of Bernie. But, but I don't know if that answers your question, but the reality is I translate what Facebook should be doing to whether I'm handling my you know, what I need to do to step up as much as I need to step up. Cool. And then we get total silence on all of that. All right. No, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a perfect time to end. Um, I want to thank you guys so much. And uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all the amazing takeaways I had. I'm sure from talking to people that you guys have had some amazing takeaways today. Um, the biggest thing I would say that besides just adding on to what Jerry said is I think that what it boils down to, if, if we are ever going to make diversity and inclusion really work and be real in companies, it needs to start at the very top. And we have to live it, not just say it, not just check a box. And until we're all doing that, with Jerry's little bit of risk taking, because that's what it's going to take for all of us to do with each other in our organizations. If we don't do it, I, you know, how can we ask other people to do it? So I, that's my challenge, I guess, to you today, is to go back and take some of those calculated risks. Thanks so much for being here, you guys. Cool.